kind of feel like companies don't want to broach the subject because then it kind of opens them up liability wise, because if they talk about active shooter and they do training for active shooter and then something happens and the officer responds uh, counter to what they were trained, you know, maybe they're afraid that that's going to open them up to, to litigation. Um, you know, I, I just I, I, I haven't really figured out why why companies aren't taking the taking the initiative to help with this kind of stuff. What do you think? And the first thing, let's look at the word liability. The first two is lie in your abilities. That's it. Now, next is the thing I, I would tell anybody that owns a company. If you are in a business of protecting property and people and you don't think at some point in time there's going to be some sort of litigation, you are in the wrong line of work. Because at some point in time, you are going to have to make a court appearance. At some point in time, your officers are going to have to go to court to testify for something. And if you don't want that to happen, I suggest you don't get into this line of work. May I suggest you sell flowers or something like that? Because as long as you are dealing with the human touch, the human aspect and their and their ills and wants and everything, you are at some point going to have to deal with the legal aspect of what you're doing. And if you treat your security officers as the lowest common denominator, then you damn sure shouldn't be having an armed security company or armed security officers, period. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for tuning in to today's Security Guard Spotlight. I'm kind of doing a little bit of a mixture of the Observe and Report podcast, the Security Guard Spotlight, because I want these conversations to go a little bit deeper than just highlighting different guards. I think that the true form of of education is going to come from these conversations. You know, as a kid, I always learned the most from my dad, my uncles, my grandparents, just sitting down and listening to two people talk. And I think that as security guards, one of the things that we miss uh, by working uh, in, in an industry that offers us a lot of independence in terms of being in the field, when you're working in law enforcement, you have partners, you have roll call, you know, you, you spend a lot of time with your comrades. And I think that in the security industry, we tend to not necessarily get that. So as we get further along with these podcasts and these conversations, I really want it to be more uh, similar to what I experienced in the military, just listening to two uh, veterans, two OGs talking. And this is where you can really pick up a lot of tips, a lot of game, and you can really learn a lot about how to handle yourself in this industry. So without further ado, today we are talking to Mr. Kenny Wise. Kenny, uh, you're down in Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma City, yeah. Are you a Sooners fan or are you a Cowboy? Listen, I'm originally from Chicago, born and raised, so I'm gonna stick with my teams. I'm gonna stick with my Bulls. Okay. Um, and I also grew up at a time when Magic Johnson first got into the league, so I'm kind of playing that role of Lakers and Bulls. Okay. So, uh, I know that upsets my wife because she's a diehard Thunder fan, yeah. and but she loves Westbrook. But now that he's going to the Lakers, she might flip. So you um, have a background in sure active shooters. Um, you know, I work for uh, yeah. like a, 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 a chain of retail stores that actually suffered uh, in Colorado yeah. this past year. Um, an active shooter. So kind of give everybody just your general background yeah. of, of what you okay. know, where you're at, and then let's talk about that. Okay. Um, again, originally from Chicago, Illinois, started my law enforcement career after getting out of the military in 1989. Did seven years in the Army. Um, I worked at one of the toughest institutions in the state of Illinois at the time. That was Joliet Prisons. Got on the SRT team there and Somebody from the Chicago Police Department said they need to apprehend you guys. So they actually pulled all of us from corrections to work with them and we serve warrants. So we serve warrants in the uh, projects. And most of it was in the area I was from. I'm like arresting guys I grew up with, which was funny. It was like, come on, man. I'm like, sorry, I got to do my job. Sorry. <laughs> but back then I was starting getting into the tactics of uh, the active shooter part when uh, a lot of the schools had uh, armed security but they did not have any training. And I remember back in 91, I got my first active shooting call and uh, it was basically a banger that came into the school and he decided that the day was the day he was looking for a rival gang banger. And I just happened to be rolling in that area with another guy. 
And keep in mind, this is before we had semi-automatics. We had 38 caliber revolvers, uh, speed loaders, and that was pretty much it. So we're engaging with a guy that had a Ruger P89 9 millimeter, and he's just he's just laying it out on us. So he's now running around in the school. We're exchanging shots. We're inside of a school building, you know, and this before cell phones and all that. So he gets out on the football field, and we gave him his last command: "Hey, stop!" You know, police and all that. So he turned on us and. Unfortunately, we had to return fire, and uh, sad to say, he uh, expired. So that got me more into the line of, you know what, given in what's happening or down the line, I, I told those guys at some point in time, we're going to have to be better at what we do, and everybody poo-pooed it, then Columbine hit. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the Columbine changed the whole dynamics of law enforcement and uh, security. Uh, come to find out that there was a SRO that was there that did engage the two kids at Columbine. Uh, but he fought them outside. And when they exchanged the shots and they went inside, protocol at that time was they were to contain, isolate, and call SWAT. And at that time, by the time SWAT stage, and I teach SWAT, I still do, even on my off days, um, is to stage and get all your equipment and do the whiteboard and figure out how to do this. Well, they're still around killing people. Right. So uh, hours later, they decided to make entry. And by that time, you know, you had all these fatalities. Um, now, I will say this, the role of the active shooter event that people are being taught, depending on where you go. I will tell people this, uh, especially in armed security, it's, uh, it's that is the hardest entity to get to have a mindset of this could happen to you. Uh, many of them work in schools. They work in hospitals. They work in places where they are responsible for people's lives. And I remember the one statement, uh, the one video you had last week about places you should not work. And that's Section 8 housing. Uh, Section 8 housing, for what it is, that's your best chance of having an active shooter event. Matter of fact, Absolutely. we just had one uh, about a week ago in the Section 8 housing here in uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, security officer was forced to fire his weapon at, at a suspect and it didn't hit him. But uh, that was his active shooter moment. And I tell these guys, if you work in these events, casinos or something like that, you better accept the fact that your active threat or active shooter moment is going to come at any time. And if I tell people I've been doing this now for I've been licensed in the state of Oklahoma since 94 and I've been an active shooter instructor for 21 years. And I find it just like pulling teeth when it comes to armed security to get them to get the training. Most of it, I tell those guys, there are people that will come to, uh, to come to you for free for the training. But we come up with some of the dumbest excuses of why we can't do it. Uh, the company won't send me or it costs too much or, or, you know, I'm working that day. OK, uh, I can argue that point. First off, when you sign on to the company, unless that company agrees to pay for your training and you still sign for it, it's still on you. Secondly, if you agree that with, that you're carrying a sidearm and you know at some point in time that you're going to be entrusted to protect the life of somebody, why would you let the state mandate you to have a requirement when you should be raising the bar on yourself Absolutely. for better training? Absolutely. And it's available. Back when I started in 94, active shooter wasn't available for security. Period. That was that was off limits for us. And the only reason I got that train was because I worked for the sheriff's department at the time. So I can go to these events, but I would train the guys that worked in the apartment complexes. When we have an empty apartment, I would teach them how to go into rooms and everything like that. Uh, but I was, I'm still amazed after all these years, how far behind armed security is. Well, Kenny, it, I think that, and maybe you can, you can speak to this, but I kind of feel like, Companies don't want to broach the subject because then it kind of opens them up liability wise, because if they talk about active shooter and they do training for active shooter and then something happens and the officer responds uh, counter to what they were trained, you know, maybe they're afraid that that's going to open them up to, to litigation. Um, you know, I, I just I, I, I haven't really figured out why why companies aren't taking the taking the initiative to help with this kind of stuff. What do you think? 
And the first thing, let's look at the word liability. The first two is lie in your abilities. That's it. Now, next, here's the thing I, I would tell anybody that owns a company. If you are in a business of protecting property and people, and you don't think at some point in time there's going to be some sort of litigation, you are in the wrong line of work. Because at some point in time, you are going to have to make a court appearance. At some point in time, your officers are going to have to go to court to testify for something. And if you don't want that to happen, I suggest you don't get into this line of work. May I suggest you sell flowers or something like that? Because as long as you are dealing with the human touch, the human aspect and their and their ills and wants and everything, you are at some point going to have to deal with the legal aspect of what you're doing. And if you treat your security officers as the lowest common denominator, then you damn sure shouldn't be having an armed security company or armed security officers, period. If you think of them that way, uh, your liability is going to come either way it comes. Uh, you get into a shooting, you're still going to court. You don't respond and you're there and people are hurt or killed. You still going to court. Yeah. Period. There is no in between with that. Well, and you Kenny, can look I, at Kenny. I, you know, this is all something that I am very well aware of. And yeah. I think that if you're if you're following my channel, you're following yeah. my, my development. Yeah, I do. Something that I talk about all the time. Yeah. But the amount of people that are that are not thinking about this and the amount of people that aren't talking about this, it's it's staggering. Um, it is. Why do you think that is, though? What do you think is keeping people from being honest about this reality? Uh, fear of showing their vulnerabilities, because then they realize, you know what? We really don't have this all together. Uh, the last company I worked for, they had a policy that was written in 1977, you know, and it was just their thinking was we've always done it this way. Or my famous statement was hearing people saying uh, it had never happened here. Uh, I tell them uh, again, if you don't want to have that long, hard talk with people about what needs to be done again, you're treating your not only your company, which is in the art of making money, and protecting people and serving and all that and your officers as the lowest common denominator that's telling your officers that you really do not care for their well-being that's telling the officers that you in their mindset is just a warm body to fill a post which means that officer if they're smart if they if they if they're smart he she or whoever think about it it is time for them to start looking at some other avenues they need to go to yeah, yeah. and i'm just being 100 about that Kenny, uh, have you come across any companies that are doing the type of things that we're talking about? You have this this active shooter uh, program. Is this something that you personally developed or is it something that you're working in conjunction with? Uh, it's a it's three steps in it. Uh, first off, the active shooter part that came from real life experience. Secondly, uh, it is in conjunction with a company uh, that is going around teaching other officers about that it's a here in oklahoma we have people that will that teaches this all the time uh tactical training specialist is one of them uh kerry spencer uh he's been doing it for 20 some years and he has been open to security and law enforcement for years and he said the hardest people to get to take the training is security because on any given day here in oklahoma city like today is sunday in my area of the city, you only got six uh, Oklahoma City cops patrol 700 square miles. That's it. But you have 80 armed security officers in a, in a given area. Oh, wow. And yeah. yeah, because you have uh, dispensaries, you have hospitals, you have clinics, you have stores. Um, you have uh, people doing roving patrols on property. It's a, it's a slew of us. The problem that we're having is, is that many of them have the mindset of it's just a job. I'm just sitting in a vehicle wasting the gas and that's it. They're never thinking they're going to have to respond to a, especially guys in apartments of a domestic and they're the closest one there. They're never thinking that uh, a burglary and they're the closest one there. They're never thinking of, I might roll up in the section eight housing and there's a rape or an abduction in progress and I'm the only one there. Absolutely. That's how some of these guys think. Yeah. Yeah. There is, there's definitely a, a kind of a naivety to what this industry is, is putting you up against. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. uh, I, I think that I could not have gotten into a better 
situation than coming to Portland because there's no, and I'm, I'm just going to be a hundred percent real. Like, yeah, there's no bullshit. Like you see yeah. the, the people see. That you're dealing with they're, they're yeah. out in your face, the issues, uh, the problems, it is so apparent and it's so in your face that there's no way to, um, to not take it serious. If you, if you're right. not taking it serious, you're literally putting your life in danger and, and yes. end up on the wrong side of the, of the situation. Now yeah. we had an officer uh, about a month ago, and this is one of the things that I'm so um, passionate about in terms of training and having these conversations. There's a company that hired a guy and they're, they're hiring people off the street. They're not getting them certified. Um, these officers don't have their CHL, they don't have their DPSST, and they're literally putting them in these positions just to, like you said, fill those voids. Um, there was an officer that was working at a Lowe's. Uh, he's doing on-site security, and someone starts to steal the pallets from the uh, floral department, okay? We're talking about like four pallets. The guy takes the pallets, and, and I'm saying all of this allegedly from what I found out on the news. So I wasn't there to say allegedly. Right. Um, allegedly takes the pallets, puts the pallets into the truck, and there is a, an argument between him and the armed security guard. Again, this guard working completely uncertified. They get into a back and forth. The, the guard allegedly pulls his car in front of the truck to block the truck from leaving. And the guy red, revs the engine and the guard gets out and fire seven shots, allegedly, into the cabin, and uh, the, the guy that was taking the pallets is killed. This situation, it just speaks volumes to how, how, how underserved the security community is, because to yeah. have a company that, excuse me, to have, yeah, a, okay. to have a company that is, that is operating under those practices, to have a organization, a statewide organization that is allowing something like that to fall through the cracks yeah. and then to have an officer who's putting himself in that situation, uh, no, no training in terms of, of de-escalation or, or yeah. even following the post orders. It's like, where do we even start? You know, yeah. where do we even start. Uh, well, and in my class, uh, me and my old partner that used to work the schools with me, we host a, um, also responds to an active threat class. And the first thing we always discuss is the use of deadly force. We will discuss that at length. I mean, everybody's in there to do all the nice hut hut and shooting stuff, but I will tell them, hey, here's the first thing we are going to discuss. When you can and when you cannot use deadly force. Uh, I explained to them that this is not like the movie Wanted where you can curve the bullet and it gets somebody right where you want them. The minute it comes out, it's looking for something. Yeah. And the minute you decide to pull it out and use it, you are 1000% responsible for what happens. And if you're doing it to protect your life and the life of someone else, and I explain to them and I give them scenarios like, okay, you're working at a factory. There's a school across the street. Cause I like using schools. Cause that's where most of my incidents have started. And there's active shooter and the shooters outside and you see them and he's running toward the daycare. And I asked them the question, can you use deadly force? And then most of them, <laughs> most of them was like, is he on the property? I said, do you know what the state statute is? I said, we have statutes that said there's justifiable homicide used and there's homicide by such and such. I said, know your case laws, know your rules and know your use of deadly force. Just because the state of Oklahoma has given you a cleat license, which is our governing body that yeah. says you can carry you. That does not mean your responsibilities end. You are supposed to be constantly proficient on, first off, the rules, policies, state laws, case laws of what there is. Secondly, if you do not know, go seek that uh, information. I said in this day and age of Google and all that, I said you can find out. It is too easy to get online and find out what you can and can't do. But again, that brings about what you just discussed. We had a guy that shot a homeless guy at a Taco Bell here in Oklahoma City uh, because the guy wanted some water. And he got into it and the guy hit him with a belt and walked away. This officer, and come to find out, he wasn't even licensed. Yep. He hasn't been he wasn't even licensed, but he was self-employed. Yep. So he he went and shot the guy, you know, several times. And to show you how this idiot was, 
called the police and he put the gun and the magazine on the hood of the car. You know, and again, that puts us in a bad light because for every hundred that are well-trained and well-versed in trying to make the industry more respectable and credible, you have these cast of idiots yeah. who feel that, you know, the law doesn't uh, pertain to them or they figure that because I own a company, I can get away with doing with certain things. Kenny, with your experience and what you've seen, the amount of time that you've put in, what are some of the, the safeguards in terms of we, we're kind of moving away from the active shooter yeah. Yeah. Uh, aspect of this conversation for yeah. one second, but no problem. If you, could, if you could implement two or three things, what would be some of the changes that you would want to see to kind of maybe make the, the barrier of entry a little bit higher? Can you think of anything that can maybe? Uh, yes. Offset yes. Yes. Um, first thing I would tell everybody is we need to get some more uh, credit hours involved. Um, once you get the license here, you got three years to get eight hours of uh, CEUs. Me personally, I think you should get it every year. I think it should be doubled. Secondly, I think uh, more likely more mental health training uh, for security uh, because most of us are working in those environments where we are dealing with mental health issues. Uh, again, we're around hospitals, we're around schools, we're around that. Third, the screening process has to be better. It has to be better. You can't get Buck and Earl just because they're the biggest babies on the block yeah. and decide, you know, these are going to be my security guards. Uh, I would like for us to have a better understanding of what the industry is about, have some respect for the industry and start having some pride in what we do. If I could instill upon that, I would tell these guys, have some pride in what you do. Treat your treat yourself first off, you know, like you're ready, you're ready to do the job. If you're one of those type of guys that look like you're a roadie at Metallica, no, you're not going to be taken seriously. Uh, have some respect for yourself. People then will have respect for you. Don't come into any situation that don't look like you're going to win. Uh, learn how to, again, verbal judo, judo is a main thing. Uh, learn more empty hand skills. I wish the state will instill that, but we're still, we're still fighting what we're carrying right now because right now if people don't realize in the state of Oklahoma, it's only been less than 20 years armed security we're allowed to carry semi-automatics. Oh, wow. Yeah, and the, big, and the biggest people that fought that, it was not the police. We were happy. We was glad to see security officers. It was the security industry. It was five guys. We have an advisory board here, and there's five old guys who carry dump pouches and revolvers that did not want any of the security in the state of Oklahoma to be armed. Yeah. Yeah, so, they, we, we had the same thing um, very similar here in Oregon. Uh, they did get rid of the advisory board. But then I feel like that opened up a huge vacuum because, you know, this whole last year, with the defund movement and the reimagining of police movement, we have in Oregon, and, and don't quote me, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost yeah. certain that it's 9,000 uh, police officers total in the state of Oregon. We have yeah. 30,000 security guards. So right. there was a great opportunity for them to say, look, we need to really reimagine what security is doing because the days of us you know, opening doors and making sure they're locked and, and kind of checking to make sure that the lights are turned off with how much they've drawn back on the police, how much they're putting the police under scrutiny. I right. feel like Oregon missed a great opportunity by not bringing security, armed security more into that fold and trying right. to find like a middle level. So you've yeah. got the lower entry of security. You've got that high level of secure of uh, law enforcement. Right. Having those 30,000 officers, Something similar to like a, a deputy system or, yeah. um, you know, I, I just feel like it was a great yeah. missed opportunity. Well, and, and that's a that's an outstanding uh, uh, concept to have. Like here in Oklahoma, I think we have in this entire state, we have 13,000 cops. That's yeah. it. Uh, and 10 percent of reserves. Yeah. So but you have 15,000 armed security. And uh, the problem that we're having with that is is that it's a reversal. The police want us to be better trained. Most of them. You still have the ones that's like trying to do that car class separation. 
And uh, having worked on both sides, I tell them this, bullets don't care about your uh, status. Right. All they looking at, I see a badge. That's it. Yeah. So uh, most of the cops want us to attend the training. It's the security industry and some security officers that don't want to attend. Uh, the biggest problem they have, again, is that they figure I'm just I'm a security guard. I'm guarding such and such. I'm only making X amount of hours, make X amount of buck an hour. It's you know, this is all we're doing. I sit in the guard shack and anything like that. And what I teach the guys is I teach them if you are a rover for a security company, I teach you vehicle ambushes because I tell them, hey, when you get to a stoplight, you need to be aware of who's on your left and right, who's behind you, that person walking across in front of you and whatnot, and eyeing you. Can you do what needs to be done? You have an 8,000 pound missile at your disposal. Yeah. Can you shoot it out of the vehicle? Can you shoot into a vehicle? And that's what we teach the guys. And we do give them a uh, state uh, credit for that. But every time we put it out there, nobody wants to attend. Kenny, you know, um, the more you, you get involved in, in culture of training, tactical yeah. training, two-way yeah. training, things like that, uh, the more aware you are of how far behind the eight ball uh, yeah. you currently are. So, you know, if we could give security officers who are watching this, if you could give them three things that they can do moving forward immediately to put them in a much better position to handle an active shooter situation. So, you know, number one, active shooter situation has kind of been characterized as a school shooting. Right. Or- mass shooting at like a grocery store or a mall right. but an active shooter situation is anyway. a banger, a yeah. domestic um a robbery yeah. so for guards across the spectrum and you know there's just there's very little that we can do in terms of changing the situation as it stands right now i think having right. this question is a great start but right. what are three things that every guard can do moving forward from this conversation that'll put them in a much safer uh situation uh, except the fact it can happen to you at any time, like you stated. Uh, if you know you're deficient in something, it's okay to admit that you need to work on something. If your gun handling skills are not up to standard, and again, I tell people, don't look at the state as your lord and master for those standard. That's on you. Uh, I know we're facing an ammo shortage, but the thing of it is, everybody can dry fire. You can... You can design a shooting program with a box of ammo easy. I've done it. You can practice with other like-minded people. You can, if you're in a building, especially at night, you can, you can practice your door entries easily. Yeah. You, can, you can practice your approaches easily. Parking garages are the easiest one to work on because you got all those cars and in the back of your mind, if I was a bad guy waiting to ambush this officer, how would I do it? Every time. So if you're that officer that I'm going to always walk toward the side when you should be walking in the middle where you can watch everything. That way, if somebody do catch up, do try to catch up to you got that space and you can react. That's what you should be working on. If you're working a Section 8 housing project, which, again, that's it is what it is. And when you're walking through a breezeway and you see people there, hey, make that plan. If this guy on the second floor starts pulling out something, this guy that's in front of me starts pulling out something, I need to be able to deal how to how I'm going to retreat and deal with this. And despite what they make most of these guys think, you better accept the fact you don't have any backup. It's a you, it's a I myself and me event. And yeah. you better have enough ammunition. You better have some good gun handling skills. And you better have some wits because what you see on TV is not on TV. Is going to be happening to you. Bullets are real. So if I were to summarize that, I would say number one is come to terms with the reality of what you're doing. Yes. Number two would be uh, become proficient with your tools. Yes. All right. Number two would become proficient with your tools. And then number three would uh, improve your situational awareness. And yes. Take the opportunity when you're at work and even when you're at home to to look at situations. Right now, I'm in my loft. I have a loft apartment that has a kind of a raised upper level, but we only have one entrance in, one entrance out. And even having this conversation with you, I always think about if I were to hear the glass break or the door open, 
you know, where my funnels are and where right. I can move to be, you know, yeah. be safe. So, so having people take advantage of that when they're at work and, and kind of yeah. be more aware of it and mindful of it. Right. Right. And your best training tools, speaking of your home, you know what your best training tool is, is two, two things. One, your mirror, your bathroom mirror will not lie. If it's showing that you're exposing all your body around in that corner, it will tell you that. Secondly, if you got a family member that you can get to play, you know, the role playing like, hey, uh, my wife, you know, I will ask her, hey, can you see me around in this this bedroom wall? If she say, yeah, I can still see a lot of you. That means I need to work on something, how to make my profile smaller. Yeah. You know, uh, the one thing I have changed dramatic, dramatically over the years, believe it or not, is the way I enter rooms. Uh, back then, I used to, when I used to get a call, I would come in there and just, you know, look around and check the door and that's fine. But out of, out of habit, I would like stand by the door, which was dumb. But now I'm getting smart enough. You know, I've gotten to the point where I look in, look around, find me a nice little wall, got my, got my tactical retreat area set up. Uh, I've run through every scenario. Like if somebody comes down this hallway and uh, we get into a shooting, this is where I need to go. This is what I need to do. Absolutely. And and my old partner, uh, Joseph Farah, and I, that's all we do when we do come across security officers. I know that it's a habit of ours. We do look at the gear that they're wearing. It's a habit. You know, like janitors will look at floors at a, at a store or something or see a clean. It's a habit. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm military law enforcement. I do look at that stuff. And well, hey, if Ken, I, but when, you're, when you're looking at a uniform, you come across a security officer, security yeah. guard. And yep. you see their uniforms. What are some of the things that you're seeing? First thing I'm looking at is their holster. Secondly, I'm looking at, is it a good retention type holster? Or is it position right where this person can draw or do they have it way in the back? Because it's just, they just threw it off. Secondly, if they're carrying a semi-automatic, I'm looking at their magazine pouches. I'm looking at their cuffs. I'm looking at their cuff case, less lethals. I'm looking at, do they have any tourniquets that's a big problem we have here also uh we do teach uh t triple c also to security officers uh we tell them hey get used to carrying that thing uh you calling on medical doing an actual threat event that's not going to happen they're not going to come in there that's on you yeah. uh carry an eye fact if you got to but be proficient in it uh i look at the uniform is the uniform, the uniform doesn't have to be a thousand percent pressed, but it doesn't look like you had a wild night on the strip and just went straight to work neither. Yeah. Uh, we've seen guys come to work wearing Jordans, you know, come to work. Uh, one guy, he had a high point pistol in a Uncle Mike nylon holster <laughs> that I started out with back in the day. You know, the one with the magazine attached to it. And I feel dude, like I feel yeah. like when you buy a high point, they just give you an Uncle Mike's poster. Yeah. Like, it's like you know, and this, yeah, and, and this, and this, and this man was proud of it. He's like, "Yeah, man, I got this high point, man. I can hit what I am at." I said, "Yeah, if you throw it, you know." Yeah. But that that shows you the mindset of the person that's that's doing it. And this person is wondering why people disrespect them all all the time. It's the way you carry yourself. If you carry yourself like somebody that knows what the hell they're doing, man or woman, regardless, if you know when you approach that scene, it could be in Section 8 housing. If you got that rapport and they know how you are when you come to that scene, I guarantee you 95% of the time you get daily let you do your job. But if you look like you are, again, look like you're a roadie for Metallica, your uniform is sloppy, and you got so many flies covering over you because you got body odor, that you need an autopsy performed on you, then yeah, people are not going to take you seriously. And if you come in there acting like Paul Blart, you definitely are not going to get any respect. So yeah, I call it, yeah, and I, I've, I've taken many officers to the side and, and explained to them, listen, this is what you are here for. Uh, you're here to represent not only the company, but yourself, because the company logo is on your, is on your shoulder, but you are, are always representing yourself. So if you act like if you acting like a slob or act as if you still in Compton, well, yeah, damn, people are not going to respect you, regardless. Yeah, and I think that you know so one of the I'm just calling it for what it is. One of the major things that everybody talks about, you know, on all the message boards and all the Facebook groups and 
any conversation yeah. that we've been a part of, people talk about the pay. Listen, we want to yeah. make more money. We want to have more respect. You know, yeah. we want to have more authority. And all of that starts with your dress and appearance. I know that yeah. that seems so easy, but it's yeah. truly where everything starts is how yeah. you carry yourself and how you, you know, present yourself. How hey, can you, he, uh, I'll, just to say real quick, uh, hey, guys, learn how to market yourself. The more training you have, the more better off you can market yourself. It's available. Absolutely. But if you just get a card and that's all you're going to do, then don't expect to be marketable. That's the best I will tell everybody. So uh, for the active shooter program, where can people find information on this? Where can they sign up? Where, you know, okay. where can we just get part of that? Oh, okay. You can get in contact with, oh man, there's so many here. Uh, people can contact me on Facebook. I'm an easy guy to find, you know, uh, the background is my old, my old calling. Cause I was a police chaplain. Back in the day, it, you will see me with my tack bed shotgun and all that. So that's how people will find me. It's Kenneth Wise. But you have tactical training specialists. They're based here in Oklahoma. Uh, they're on Facebook also. Uh, you have a guy by the name of Manuel Holland. He is a police officer in northeastern Oklahoma. Him and a guy named Zach Hedner. They're both cops. And they are very, very passionate with letting security officers train an active shooter. But the difference is it's mostly for solo officers responding to an event, not with five or six guys. So these events that they teach and that I teach, it's going to be you and you alone. So Kenny, if you have any links, uh, you can just send those to me yep. and I'll add. I will. That I will. And that I will. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Uh, we're going to, we're going to let you go here in a second and okay. listen, the important thing that I want people to take away from this is that with Kenneth, uh, with with Doug, with every person that we've talked to so far, all of the information is coming back to this one just undeniable point. And that's that as a security officer, it all rests on our shoulders. It's incumbent on each one of us to do yep. all of these things that are necessary yep. for us to be yep. to be safe. So, hey, can I say one more thing? Absolutely, of course. Okay. Uh, I tell everybody also this. After being in the shooting, you are, I would recommend that you get uh, some mental health because it's not like TV where you go back to work or anything like that. It does play on you. Uh, contrary to what people may think, uh, those things will bother you. And if you don't have a good support system to address that, I guarantee I am speaking as a living witness it will come back and hunt you. I have guys who've been in these type of situations in shootings and they either lost their marriage, they lost their jobs, five of them committed suicide because the industry does not have any post-critical incident help for their guys. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed also. Wow, outstanding. Kenny, listen, that, that to me right there is uh, worth its weight in gold. And I appreciate you sharing that because the mental health aspect of what we're doing is so often overlooked. We talk about mental health and the people that we're working with. We don't talk about it enough with ourselves and the people right. that we're working side by side with. So uh, yeah. thank you for sharing that. And Hey man, yeah. listen, um, I want to thank you so much for coming on. No problem. I, I, man, man, it's a hot, it is on it. I'm truly humbled that, you know, I'm on this, <laughs> on this. I really am. I really am. Well, good deal. All right. So guys, listen, uh, let's all thank Kenny. Kenny, thank you so much. Thank uh, you guys. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your knowledge. And appreciate you guys. We'll add those links to the video here and we'll allow people to reach out. I will definitely uh, be reaching out to the people that you talked about today. And I have no problem flying to Oklahoma. I love Oklahoma. So just got to get there. We'll when take care of you. Tomatoes come. We'll, we'll take care of you. <laughs> all right, man. Thank you so much. Okay? All right. Thank you guys. All right. Take care. Bye.